Uh, welcome, uh, if you're new or otherwise. Uh, good to <laughs> good to see you. Um, really excited about this evening. Um, thanks all for attending, as it were. Um, just a quick uh, talk about what we're doing. Uh, firstly, we're working with Conway Hall, who are a fine place for free, free thought and inquiry and ethical thought. Um, this particular part of it is um, a strand that I've worked with them with about called reweirding, which is um, the, the idea being, uh, it's about going out and looking at the world and seeing it in new and different ways. Um, I, I hope that makes sense. I've not really thought it through any more from, than that. Um, it's kind of, it's a work in progress. What we really like though is like landscape culture and um, science and things that help people see the world in a different way. Um, a lot of landscape writing, a lot of, there's a lot of books about men going for walks. So uh, what Kerry is doing with her book is, is really exciting to us because we all, we all really like walking. There's lots of hellos coming in from different parts of the world. Hello, all of the world. Um, so before I introduce Kerry, um, I'm going to go through uh, how we're going to do it this evening. Um, Kerry's going to speak for about 45 minutes or so. Her internet may let her down. Um, but we be, we'll, be, we'll have a brief interlude if that's the case. We can all go and get popcorn from somewhere. And then she'll be back, uh, but hopefully that won't happen. She'll speak for 45 minutes, then we'll do a live uh, Q&A. Um, how we're going to do that is, if you look at the bottom of Zoom, you can see a, uh, a Q&A button. If you type questions as they occur to you into that, and then afterwards we'll um, offer to open your um microphones so you can ask your question directly to Kerry. I hope, I hope that's okay. Um, so to introduce this evening's speaker, uh, Kerry Andrews, uh, really sorry we're not doing this in Conway Hall but it's great that people from all around the world can take part in, in this too. Um, she is a senior lecturer at Edge Hill University and writes on uh, forgotten histories and in, in literature and other such things, I can't read my own notes. And she's a leader of Women in the Hills, uh, an organization looking at giving women access to uh, upper upland landscapes, I hope. She's the author of Wanderers, A uh, History of Women Walking. Uh, That's why she's here this evening. Uh, we're all excited to hear about it. So um, do please welcome uh, Kerry Andrews to your laptops, to Conway Hall and, and to this talk. Thank you. Applause. Thanks ever so much, Scott, and thank you so much to everybody who's come. It's been wonderful seeing all the different locations popping up. Um, so whilst I'm sad that this isn't in person, I don't know that we'd have had such a, a wide variety of people from so many different locations, and I think that's really wonderful. So thanks so much. Um, so I'm, I've just got a couple of slides just to hang what I'm going to talk about off, which is a terrible sentence, but just to give a little bit of structure to um, the talk that I'm going to give. Um, but what I'm particularly looking forward to is the Q&A afterwards. So please do fire your questions at me. And I'd also like to say a massive thank you to the team at Conway Hall as well for hosting the event. Um, it's really exciting to be able to come and talk to you all about a book that's very dear to my heart, um, has taken a lot of years to get um, to turn into an actual object. Um, and I hope you enjoy the session and thanks again for coming. So I'm just going to share my screen with you so you can just see um, those slides. I hope this is going to work. Um, so hopefully you can see that. Um, if there is a problem at all, I'm hoping that Scott will just dive in and, and shout at me that things aren't working. Um, so as I say, I'm really, really glad to be here. And, and one of the things I, I perhaps wanted to talk about with the book um, was the process of writing it, um, which sort of ties into um, what Scott was saying about the, the domination, I think, of, of, the, of the literary marketplace with books about male walkers, but very few, if any, about women. Um, because part of the reason why the book's taken so long is um, it was very difficult to get it placed. I, took ages to get anyone to take it and I'm so grateful that Reaction um, backed it um, when I had lost all hope that anybody would. So part of the, 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 the book's long gestation is sort of tied up with um, the sort of exclusion of women walkers from the literary record. I sort of found myself part of that as well. Um, so 
one of the things that um, the book does, and this is both a strength and limitation, I think, um, because when I was beginning to, to research the book, which was back in 2012, and what the, 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 sort of the main prompt for that was reading Robert McFarlane's The Old Ways, and this was the first book of Robert's that I'd read, and I was absolutely enchanted by the way he wrote about walking. I thought it was really beautiful. Um, I had an awful lot of writer envy. I thought if I could hope to write a book like that, I could die happy. But I also got quite frustrated reading it that there was so much emphasis on the relationship between the male walker and the male forebears, um, the literary walker writers that Robert was calling on. Um, and that sort of drew me to look at other books about walking. Um, I'm, I'm not going to name the ones that really got me across, but there, was a, there were several books that I, that I looked at, all of which made me increasingly angry about this, what was a, a really persistent denial that women wanted to walk, that they could walk, that they ever did walk. And for the, the writers that I was looking at, they used that as an excuse for not bothering to talk about women. So there was one book that was 250 odd pages long and they devoted four to women walkers. And that was Virginia Woolf and Dorothy Wordsworth. Um, such a brief treatment. And I, I just didn't see that that was remotely plausible. You know, I'm, I'm a very keen woman walker and if you've read the book, you'll know that that's really integral to what the, what the story of the book, the narrative of the book is, is, is my own personal experiences. And I'll perhaps talk a little bit more about that in a while. Um, but thinking about those and knowing all the women I know that go walking, it just didn't seem to me at all credible that there was nothing in the whole history of walking that was about women. So I started um, exploring archives, which is what I've been trained to do. I'm an expert in romantic era literature and archives of my bread and butter. So I started rummaging around, um, seeing what I could unearth, and it didn't take me long to start finding quite a lot of really interesting material. Um, some of it had been briefly touched on, but no one had seemed to draw the connection that there was a wider tradition of women's walking here, that there was a, a whole link of over the course of several hundred years of women finding walking really important creatively and personally in a way that these celebrated books about men had said that walking mattered to men. Um, so I perhaps thought about writing a book that was theorising that, you know, a more academic book, but as I was doing this research, I realised that it, we actually just needed a bedrock, that there, there was a story that needed to be told that just established that women did, in fact, in history, walk and walk a lot and, and find it really powerful for them. So that was the sort of the, the impetus uh, for the book, was that sort of sense that we just needed to lay the framework. So I only cover 10 women in this book, as you'll, as you'll know if you've, if you've looked at the contents. Uh, that's absolutely not the limits of women walkers out there. And I'd very much hope to see other books come and fill in all of the gaps that I've left in this book. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gaps. Um, I chose a quite a strict um, criteria for the women that I included because for me, one of the key things that we needed to cover and establish was that women, right, women walkers existed, but women walkers were also finding walking important for their creativity. So the narrative that we've inherited of people like William Wordsworth, John Clare, John Keats, all finding walking integral to their lives as poets, and, that, and from that walking having its cultural power, I thought that was the thing that needed to be done for women, first of all. So the women I've included had to reflect in their writing on what walking meant for their creativity. So that ruled out quite a few. And I'll, I'll talk in a little bit about the women who didn't make it in, because there's so many fascinating stories there. So I very much hope that this is just the beginning of a discussion of a, a literary tradition about women's walking and I hope very much that my book is eventually uh, superseded by other studies, other people's experiences. I very much hope this will be part of a much longer conversation and I know from talking to quite a few people and some of those who are here tonight are working in various ways on projects exploring women's walking and that is just so exciting. So that sort of hopefully gives a, a bit of a sense of how the book came to be. Um, partly me getting cross at Robert McFarlane, partly me being a fangirl for Robert McFarlane, but very much wanting to challenge what I was finding on the bookshelves, which was this dismissal of, of women ever having any kind of, placing any kind of value in walking. 
Um, and that sort of emerged as well as me reading Robert McFarlane. It's also emerged from my own enjoyment of walking and why I walk and the sort of pleasure that I take from walking. And I think one of the things that's become most clear to me during the course of writing this book and most particularly afterwards is the different experiences that I have as a woman walker when I'm walking in particular when I'm walking alone. And I've had a couple of really extraordinary experiences that I don't think would have happened to me if I'd have been in company, um, if I'd have been in company with men, certainly. And, and one of the most extraordinary ones was I was um, walking in the Scottish Highlands, which is um, not exactly near where I live. I live in the Scottish borders, but it's where I escape to whenever I can. And I took my sister-in-law and my husband up to Ben Crook and... Um, to walk the horseshoe and my sister-in-law struggled um, with the walk and she eventually turned round before we got particularly high we just got as far as the reservoir um, and my husband insisted that I carry on alone which was great but it was one o'clock by this point and the summit was still quite a long way away so it wasn't until about three o'clock that I made it up onto the summit and, and this was a lovely summer's day there was no danger of the weather but time was pushing on and I remember getting up to the summit and feeling really quite anxious that there was so much of the walk to do. I planned to do the horseshoe and carry on round. And there I was on my own. I drank a lot of water. It was very hot. And there I am on this massive remote mountain summit. And there was a family up there who had also summited late. And they saw that I was alone. And they said, well, would you like to walk with us? Um, and that was absolutely, given that I was feeling so uneasy, that was just absolutely terrific. So we set off as a group of five now and, and we carried on around the horseshoe. Um, and that was a really fortunate thing because I started to get heat stroke because I hadn't got enough water with me. I'd, I'd carried three litres but run out. So they helped me top up and help make sure I didn't get ill with it. So that was really good. And then on the descent, they got confused about the direction. And luckily, I'd got um, the sat-nav with me and could point the exact path that we needed to take down. So we had this really interesting cooperative experience. And by the time we got down to the walk, to the bottom of the walk, it was nine o'clock gone. And God bless my husband. He'd been off to Oban with his sister-in-law, um, treated her to fish and chips, and had brought back fish and chips that the ladies in the chip shop had wrapped up for him. And he put it on the um, engine of the car to keep it warm. So I had this absolutely fantastic meal um, whilst absolutely exhausted. But what I think was the most interesting thing about that experience was the way in which that would never have happened in company. And I would have missed out on something really rich. There was lovely conversations we had um, with this family. I really enjoyed getting to know them just in that sort of brief encounter. Um, but it was just a really interesting experience. And I've had others since where as a woman walking alone, I've had fascinating conversations. I've been invited places. And I think for me, that's part of what shapes how I've approached writing the book and the confidence I've had in knowing that women would have found walking to be really important is, is, is how valuable it's been to, my, to, to me in my own life as well. And that there have absolutely been times when I've found myself stuck with the book and walking has helped me unlock those, those moments. So it felt important to include some of that in, in the story and place myself in the tradition of, of, of women's walking, which is, I guess, what I hope the book achieves, perhaps above all else, is give this sense of there being a really rich literary history. And that whilst you know, Robert McFarlane can draw on Edward Thomas, he can draw on William Wordsworth, he can draw on John Keats, that for women walkers, there is an equally rich tradition. And that any time a woman sets out into the, into the, onto a path, into a, onto a walk, that there's this whole body of women writers who were there before, and, and, and who we can carry with us in the sorts of ways that seem to empower male walker writers so much. And I, and I think for me, that's, if, if the book achieves anything, that's the thing I'd, I, I hope it achieves. Um, so I, I, perhaps one of the things it would be nice to pick up on in the Q&A, if this is something other people are interested in, is talking about what a, a, a female tradition of walking might look like um, and, and how we can perhaps counter these narratives of, of men's, walking being so important and women's being so peripheral. So as I say, that's something that I, I really wanted to explore in the book. Um, I've, I've 
because I keep getting it wrong on walks as well. The picture I've chosen of myself is coming down a mountain in the Highlands with my crampons on. No, in fact, I think I just corrected my crampons. My friend told me at that little rocky outcrop there that I'd got them on back to front, um, which was the second time I got them on backwards. So perhaps I shouldn't always be walking on my own. I seem to get myself into some trouble. Um, but there is a more dignified women's tradition, um, which I, I hope the book articulates. Um, so what I'd also perhaps like to talk about a little bit more um, in this talk is some of the women and perhaps focus a little bit more on some of the women that I cover and, and why I think they're so interesting and, and why I hope that you find them interesting as well. Um, so there's a whole range of, of women that I, that I found and decided to include in the book and lots of different backgrounds, lots of different life experiences. Um, and very few people having exactly the same sorts of understanding of walking, which I think adds to the richness of that tradition that I'm hoping this book starts to establish. Um, but I think one of the writers that really that I particularly enjoyed writing about was Sarah Stoddart Hazlitt, um, who I only knew very, very vaguely as the wife of the essayist, the, the Romantic Era essayist, William Hazlitt. I'd read William Hazlitt's writing. I, I knew all about his books and and his friendship with William Wordsworth and, and lots and lots to do with his life. And I had absolutely no idea about his wife um, until I came across an essay talking about a diary that she kept in which she described her walking. So it was a real treat to uncover this whole other personality that had sort of been obscured by her husband's very prominent career and be able to do something with that in the book. And I think one of the things that stood out for me, particularly with her, um, was just the fierceness of her determination um, to resist her husband and how much more brave she was than him. Um, so there's a, a lovely point in, in her diary where her visit to Ben Lomond overlaps with her husband's visit to Ben Lomond. So in case you've not sort of read the Sarah Stoddart chapter or if you've not yet looked at the book, um, she was brought up to Edinburgh to divorce, to be divorced um, by William Hazlitt because he'd begun an affair and he wanted to marry his mistress. Um, so she had all sorts of horrible things to do with the divorce in Edinburgh. And her diaries talk in considerable depth about the physical toll that takes on her body. She has all sorts of um, eating, dis uh, disordered eating, her abdomen hurts, she has these horrible headaches. And the only cure for these ailments is, is to walk. So she walks miles and miles and miles around the city. And that's what keeps her in some sort of equilibrium. Um, but William goes off, he heads off over to Glasgow um, to do some lectures at Anderson's Institute, which um, is now the University of Strathclyde. And his absence frees Sarah up to go off and have her own experiences. So she takes this opportunity to go up to um, the Highlands, the Southern Highlands. Um, but she didn't know that her husband was also taking a tour of the Southern Highlands. And there's this lovely moment in William Hazlitt's um, letters where he's writing about how he, he tried to go up Ben Lomond and how the weather was so awful and he was so wet and it was just the most terrible thing. And why would anyone bother? It was just this most miserable experience. He beats this very ignominious retreat from the, from the mountain. And I don't think it was exactly the same day, but there was only a day or two out that Sarah Stoddart Hazlitt comes over the pass from Loch Catrin down to Loch Lomond across the flanks of Ben Lomond in the same vile weather that had defeated her husband. And instead of being turned away by it, instead of being upset by it, instead of being beaten down by it, um, she absolutely relishes it. And she, she does get lost. She is worried about whether she's going to find her way, but she does. And in her diary, she exults in her physical accomplishments, in the fact that she was able to overcome all of the obstacles that stood in her way. And, and for me, that's a really lovely contrast between this rather villainous, venal um, character that her husband is, very opportunistic and, and wanting in, in guts, really, and how brave his wife is in comparison, especially given the sorts of experiences he's putting her through. So then when she records all of these distances in meticulous detail, documenting all the sorts of physical suffering that she goes through, but also how much pleasure she takes in that, um, I find that contrast with her husband's experience is really quite illuminating. Uh, I think that's an absolutely terrific um, part of, of Sarah Stoddart Hazlitt's story. What I wasn't able to verify, and which therefore I couldn't include in the, in the book, um, was that there is, some, there is some evidence that she was a competitive walker 
and that before her marriage she was doing all sorts of, of things going along to walking matches and this was a, a thing in the early 19th century was walking competitions involving women and there is a little bit of evidence to suggest that she was involved in that but she didn't write about it herself so that didn't make it into the book but there's I think a whole nother side of Sarah Stoddart has that, that remains to be uncovered and perhaps a, a story about the, the role of walking competitions and the way in which those sorts of I, and that sort of knowledge has vanished from our, our record of, of walking in its history. So she, for me, is a really amazing character. And the fact that she only writes this very short diary, it's only three months long, there's not, it's not that many words. Uh, and what, and I'd, I'd love to know what compelled her to write about those walks at that time. Why did she choose a two-keeper diary then? Um, what, what was the thinking there? And, and of course, very glad that she did, but slightly sad that there isn't more documentary evidence for other elements of her career, other parts of her life that would perhaps have been really illuminating. So she for me is one of the, the sort of the major characters in, in, in the book. Um, but I was also really taken uh, with Harriet Martineau's story uh, and, and in part because I started walking when I was in uh, Yorkshire and relatively late, it was um, only about uh, 10 years ago or so that I really got into walking and I, my apprenticeship was in Yorkshire and I still remember the very first time I went over to the Lake District and was absolutely blown away by the, the, the size of the mountains, the variety of the hills, just how beautiful it was and also the literary sort of reverberations, the history that sort of was, was, was within those hills. So reading Harriet Martineau talk about that first arrival in the Lake District, there was a lot of resonance for me there between my own experience as a novice walker arriving in this sort of hallowed ground and Harriet Martineau who arrives there having been very, very unwell for several years with a, an illness we won't be able to diagnose, but may have had some sort of psychosomatic element to it. Um, suddenly recovering and in that recovery finding herself extraordinarily physically capable and testing herself on the on the, on the Lake District and claiming um, this is, uh, announcing the intention to learn it by walking across it and then doing exactly that within a few months of arriving. Um, I never quite managed to do that my visits have been much more sporadic but that sense of wonderment that Harriet Martineau manages to express in her writing. I think it's, it's really powerful for me as someone who has loved the Lake District. And I also really like the way in which she uses that knowledge um, as part of the publications that she produces later, in particular, the guidebook that she writes in 1855. Um, there aren't many examples of women using their experiences of walking as um, grounds for being trusted as guides to an area. And I think that makes Harriet Martineau's account really significant, um, that she's got all this knowledge that she can draw on and that she claims for herself. Um, so, so that connection for me is really significant. And I, th and I think it's really lovely also to see her locating herself within the literary Re re um, relevance of the, of the place as well. She becomes friends with William Wordsworth, she becomes friends with Dorothy Wordsworth, though Dorothy is in her final decline by this point and um, has been phys very physically frail for a long time. Um, but she is very much part of the literary establishment. I think part of her walking there is also walking herself into the literary history of the hills and becoming part of the legend of the Lake District as well. And, and I, I think that's a really bold and really interesting thing to do as a woman in the mid 19th century. So her story for me has, has a lot of re um, relevance as well. Um, and I think for me, one of the, the writers that I have looked up to most as a, as a woman walker has got to be uh, Nan Shepherd. Um, who's writing about mountains is, is some of the loveliest that I've ever read. Uh, and I think the, ser the spiritual seriousness with which she takes walking and her experiences um, is, is really illuminating and adds something really distinctive, not only to the tradition of, of, of women's walking, but to mountain literature more generally. I think, that, I think that's a, a totally new dynamic. And also the insistence on avoiding peaks, you know, moving through the dark places, looking for the unusual places, the places that nobody else goes. Um, and finding in them enormous meaning. Um, 
I've made a couple of attempts to do this in the, in the Cairngorms, which is somewhere else that I really love to go. Um, but I had a very, a very poor attempt at this on the barns of Bynack, upon Bynack Moor um, in the Cairngorms. Um, we went up on a perfectly dry day and I'd read the, the part in The Living Mountain where Nan Shepherd talks about sitting on top of the barns um, like it's a house. And I thought that sounds fun. Um, but when we got there, it was so slickly wet. I've no idea where the water came from. It was, as I say, it was a beautiful, clear September day. Um, but I really didn't fancy getting up there and then trying to get back down again. Um, so I just had to sit next to the barns and imagine climbing it and sitting on it like, like um, Nan did, uh, like the queen of the castle. Um, so she's someone I, I admire. And, and also, like, and I think there's probably a theme in the ones that I've in the writers that I've really enjoyed working on is a certain kind of bravery which I think I aspire to but don't manage to achieve for myself. Um, you know Sarah Stoddart Hazlitt being so resistant to the drudgery and the degradations that her husband throws at her. Harriet Martineau throwing off years of weakness and illness to be one of the most you know capable walkers in the Lake District. You know walking faster than any man who chooses to walk with her just blowing them all away. And, and Nan Shepherd too, also very brave um, and, and walking in places that I have found really, really tricky and would, would be quite anxious to go to. And, and she finds them per, you know, to be homely, comforting, meaningful places. Um, and and, and I, I, I think that's perhaps part of the reason why I've enjoyed writing on them so much is, is that sort of looking up to them and, and hoping that one day I might be as accomplished as them. Um, but I think what I'd perhaps like to finish talking about um, before opening up to Q&A is um, to tell you a little bit about the women walkers who didn't make it into the book itself. And part of the reason why I included an appendix was to give some sort of sense of some of the possibilities um, that lay beyond what I'd included. And, and that was by no means exhaustive either. Um, because I had this very constraining um, set of criteria that they had to reflect on their writing and in in on their walking in a particular way. Um, but there were so many, and there are so many other amazing stories that different kinds of books telling different stories would, would be able to make use of and would be fascinating to tell. Um, so one of the ones I'm saddest about not making it into the book is Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, who was a writer in the late 18th century, um, a very controversial figure. She was um, not, she didn't live according to the moral customs of the day. Uh, she had a, a child out of wedlock um, and, and lived a very unusual life. And the relationship that she had with, this, with her daughter's father was very complicated. And there's some evidence to suggest that he sent her off on some sort of espionage mission to Scandinavia um, in the mid 1790s. So she wrote an account of her journey to Sweden and Norway and Denmark. And she writes really interestingly, though extraordinarily briefly, which is why she didn't make it into the book, about where she walks. And she walks quite frequently. And she often walks and reflects on the breakdown of her relationship with her partner, um, her worries for her daughter in this unforgiving world that makes few opportunities available to women, especially an educated woman. And Wollstonecraft herself struggled to, to make a livelihood for herself that was independent of men. She ran a, a school for, for young girls that, that failed. She was a jobbing writer. She wrote reviews. She translated. She wrote novels. Um, she worked very hard at, at um, sort of hack work. Um, so she's very concerned in her journal about the effects that world is going to have on her daughter, her vulnerable little daughter. Um, so there's all these sort of currents at work in her writing. Um, and this account of this journey where she's in, in, in undertaking some sort of um, secret commercial business on behalf of her, her former partner um, never gets fully explained because again, it's a, it's a secret mission. So it's only sort of touched on very tangentially, you never quite work out why she's there in the first place. And this is by no means a, a place that's typical for anybody to visit in the 18th century, let alone a, a sole woman. So this account of her walking on the coasts of Scandinavia was really interesting, but she just talks about it so briefly that I didn't think there was enough material there to be able to make a story out of it that was sufficient for inclusion in the book. Um, but what was made that particularly frustrating and sad was that her 
her younger daughter, Mary Shelley, um, who of course uh, would go on to write Frankenstein, also had a very unusual life and was also quite interested in walking. Um, and it would have been lovely to have included the two of them. So Mary Shelley, um, when, before she's Mary Shelley, she's um, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin at this point, um, has run away, has eloped with Percy Bysshe Shelley, um, who is married um, to someone else. And they do a tour of Europe. And Mary Shelley writes a really interesting account of this in 1816. But again, the references to walking are quite brief. And she doesn't really go into a, any sort of explanation about why she's, you know, what she's doing or what she's thinking whilst she's walking. Um, so that's, again, why, why I didn't really feel I could include her. But the, 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 the thought of both mother and daughter going off to Europe, finding walking significant, and, and especially given that um, it was giving birth to Mary Shelley that would eventually kill Mary Wollstonecraft. She died of puerperal fever 10 days after giving birth to Mary Shelley. Um, that there's this really interesting connection that perhaps somebody else would be able to do something with because I think there's there's a really interesting relationship there. So I, I wish they'd both been able to be in the book, um, but the closest I could get was um, putting them into the appendix. Um, I think perhaps one of another <laughs> really frustrating figure um, was Jane Austen, who I know walked loads. There's all sorts of references in her letters to say she's walking all over Hampshire. Um, she particularly hated walking on muddy lanes, so she loathed winter walking. She complains bitterly about this, but she was walking all the time. Um, and one of the people that I love most in literature, one of the most lovely woman, women walkers from literature, for me is Lizzie Bennett from Pride and Prejudice. And I, and I, I really adore the scene where she comes into um, you know, this, this fancy house with her hems covered in mud because she's walked across the fields to see her sister. And she's totally unapologetic about walking whilst reading, walking for pleasure, walking for contemplation. Um, you know, she's a real heroine of mine uh, for, for her very brave and uncompromising walking. And, and I think it's, it's evident that there are parallels between Lizzie Bennett's walking and what Jane Austen was doing herself. But she writes so boringly about the walking in her letters, I went for a walk, is pretty much the extent of what she says. Um, so again, making a story out of that was beyond my powers. Um, but she was definitely walking, she was definitely finding it useful and important, but just didn't write about it in any sort of sustained way. So um, maybe someone will be able to do something with Jane Austen. Um, but there are lots and lots of others, and I hope that um, if you've enjoyed Wondrous, that you'll be interested in exploring some of these other women. Uh, and one other that I would perhaps suggest would be worth looking at is um, a short story writer called Kate Chopin, who, again, like all of these women, had a really interesting life. Um, and she spent a lot of her, her life in Louisiana, um, but also did tours of Europe shortly after her marriage. And there are, um, in her letters and in her diaries, she talks about walking around the cities and sometimes walking at night alone in the cities. Um, and some of her short stories centre on women walking alone and some of the consequences for that. So there's a really interesting parallel in her work between what she does as a writer and, and what, her, uh, what, what she does as a, as a woman walker as well. Um, so there's lots and lots of other stories to be told. And as I say, I really hope that my book will be superseded, that there will be other contributions. And there are lots and lots of other stories to be told about women's walking. Um, and I hope that any woman who walks and has read this book or thought about some of these women will feel that connection with other women writers to have that sense of a tradition at the back and I think that's perhaps the loveliest thing in, in Kathleen Jane is really lovely forward is articulating that sense of connection of carrying with you all of these women and and thinking about what that does to see women in the hills in the mountains for the last several centuries knowing that women have been there for years and years that they always have been there and that the hills are women's territory as much as they are men's and that they mean as much to women as they do to men. So I hope that you've enjoyed reading the book if, that, if you've managed to do that. I hope I've been able to fill in some of the information, some of the ideas behind the book and some of the, the things that I wish I'd been able to include but hadn't. Um, but I think at this point um, I'll stop talking and open up the session to, to questions because um, I'm very much interested 
in hearing what you have to say. So thanks ever so much to list, for listening to me and um, I'm really looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Kerry. Um, we, we do have someone who's asked a question, so I'm just gonna see about opening your microphone. And uh, hang on a sec. I'm a little bit rusty in doing this, everyone. Please forgive me. We do have one question, so hang on a second. So Georgina, hopefully we're opening your microphone. Hello? Hi, can you hear me? We can. Hi. I didn't think I was going to be the first question. Um, hi. Shall I just go? Please do, please do. Hi. Um, thank you so much for writing such a brilliant book, Kerry. I've really enjoyed reading it. Um, what I'm interested in, um, I'm currently trying to compare Nan Shepherd and Dorothy Wordsworth's uh, writing and walking, and I'm really interested in how Dorothy uses her walking to keep her memories of her brother alive, um, um, going by going to the same place, revisiting, and, and following the same walks quite often. And I, in the research I've done so far, it seems that Nan Shepherd also took the same walks quite frequently. So I was wondering <coughs> if you think that sort of memory was important to her as well in, in her walking and, um, you know, reliving memories and maintaining memories of happy times by, by revisiting the same places. Yeah, I, I thank you so much, Georgina, for a really lovely question. Um, I, I think you're right. Um, I think for Nan Shepherd that being in the same place has a real significance. That I'm not sure it's for quite the same reasons as Dorothy Wordsworth. I think Dorothy quite deliberately rewalks exactly the same paths over and over again. Um, I think for, for Nan, the rewalking is more broadly across the Cairngorms, that the whole place for her has those sorts of meanings. Um, <coughs> that's a more generalised um, significance. Um, and she writes in her letters really interestingly about escaping to the Cairngorms, running away to the Cairngorms, sometimes running away from her walk, from her writing to the Cairngorms. So there's a sense in which the Cairngorms serves as some sort of emotional and perhaps intellectual retreat as well. And that, that the familiarity of the place is comforting in a, in a particularly powerful way, which I think is subtly different to what Dorothy Wordsworth is doing, which is very much trying to reimagine and reinvoke people or experiences or, or times that have gone um, by rewalking the path and, and recalling memories and experiences that only exist along that specific path. Uh, as I say, I think there are slightly different things at work, but I think you're absolutely right that there is, that there is a real importance to keeping going back to the same place over and over again. That for both women, that, that has an enormous meaning in their lives. Thanks, Kerry. Um, the next person who asked the question was, and I'm really sorry if I mispronounce this, uh, Brayonin. I'm going to uh, unmute you. Hello. Can you hear me now? We can, yeah. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Um, so, my question my name's Brian. Um, it's just you spoke briefly about character portrayals with Jane Austen. Um, and I always find it very interesting that you have kind of a uh, strong polarization. So you, I, through my reading, I either seem to see portrayals of women taking solitary kind of uh, walks across kind of very wild spaces, heaths or hills, or kind of a more urban walking. So taking a turn and this idea of a daily walk. Um, I'm just wondering if you kind of had sought or addressed that kind of polarization in walking in women's history. Can you just um, give me a little bit more about what you mean by that polarisation, just so I know exactly? Yeah, I mean, just the idea that um, there, it seems that there's either like a very um, savage kind of wild landscape in which that takes place as a sort of escapism, um, or there's a kind of daily walking that goes on within their daily lives. Um, I think both play kind of a central part, but are uh, used to express very different things. Yeah, I, 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 th I think there's quite a complicated relationship between those two sorts of ideas. And I think the relationship is different for each of the women that I, that I write about, and it will probably be different for every woman walker who, who writes about their walking. But I'm, I'm thinking about um, how Virginia Woolf 
um, writes about it because she writes, she doesn't go off to any of the, the mountainous landscapes, but she is really interested in the explorations of Suffolk and the more rural landscapes. Mm. Um, I think for her, she doesn't think of it as a polarisation. She sees the two areas when she's in London and when she's in Suffolk. They both serve different purposes for her as a creative person. That in London, the vibrancy of walking the streets, of being in a city, of bumping into people, of having those sorts of encounters is extraordinarily stimulating. That's, that's what sends her brain into all sorts of creative areas. You know, she literally walks to the lighthouse into being whilst walking the streets of London. But she writes in her journals about how too much of that makes her, her, she actually talks about her brain overheating, that it sends it too far into that. And that coming back to Suffolk cools it back down. And that there's a way in which Suffolk acts as a sort of counterbalance, that it opens up different possibilities. It um, does different things to her mind. And she's really interested in, in the relationship between walking and, and, and her mental health and her mental state and how that connects to her creativity. So I think for me, one of the most interesting things that she writes is when she describes walking the pavements of London as a way of entering the rooms of her mind, that there's a mental geography that's being laid over the physical geography of the streets and that she can only access certain parts of her mind by walking in certain places, that she unlocks and opens up doors by walking through these, these particular routes. But too much of that, and she ends up, she writes, feeling like she's walking on a tightrope, like she's going to fall off the pavement into an abyss. So there's a really, really delicate balance that she needs to strike between the urban and the rural, between the city and the wild. And that too much of either, um, she gets frustrated if she's in the country too long, that too much of either is, is bad for her creatively and it's really bad mm -hmm. for her mentally. So... I think, as I say, I think there's a really, for, for all of these writers, there's a really complicated relationship between those two elements. Um, and I think they engage with those ideas differently. And, and you can perhaps see that with Sarah Stardart Hazlitt as well. Um, the importance of the city walking that she does mm -hmm. um, to, to maintaining some sort of physical health. It, it doesn't keep her completely right. But it does do something. And then these, ex, you know, she just explodes off into the highlands um, on these mad eight day tours where she walks 130 miles. Um, and they equally serve different purposes. You know, one keeps a right most of the time and the other blows the cobwebs away. Um, so a really complicated, I, I'm, I'm repeating myself here, but I, I, I just think it's a really interesting relationship. And I think that's a really lovely question to ask. Um, and that's perhaps pushed me into thinking in a little bit more detail about a relationship that I'd perhaps taken for granted or hadn't is sufficiently interrogated. So thank you so much for asking a really cracking question. Thank you for answering. You've answered it, answered it completely. So thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you. Could I open up the uh, next microphone of uh, Zoe Chan? Hello, Zoe. Nice to see your name on screen. Are you there? While Zoe's unmuting, um, which I hope she is, um, someone else, e Emily Ankers, has asked, um, that she's interested to hear which archives you visited. Um, then she says, don't put me on a mic, ha ha, Scott, you can ask. I'm not gonna do that if you don't want to. So um, Kerry, what archives did you visit during your researches? Um, not that many actual physical archives, which is uh, perhaps what makes me a bit cross about people not bothering to tell these stories before. Um, it's, I think the only archive I actually went to was the National Library of Scotland. Um, and that was to look at Nan Shepherd's letters and they also had a copy of the, the really rare journal article which republishes Sarah Stoddart Hazlitt's um, diary. So they were things that I couldn't access anywhere else. But for most of the other materials, they were there on Google, um, you know, it was part of the digitization that Google did a few years ago. So if you want to have a look at Elizabeth Carter's letters, they are all on Google and you just need to search you know, walking and there's this wealth of material. Um, and thinking about Harriet Martineau, all of her works are online and you can search them for walking. Um, it's, it's not even, you know, I, I'm embarrassed that, I man that I've written about those sorts of things because they were so easy to find. Um, so these men that were saying, oh no, we couldn't find anything in the archives. There's, tons of stuff that you just needed to google and it would have been there um 
there are other things that are a little bit more rare. So Nan Shepherd's letters, um, which I have been using as part of um, the research for this book and the next project that I'm working on, um, they have involved trips to Cambridge and had COVID not intervened, I'd have been having a very happy summer up in Aberdeen working at the university library there. Um, but for this project, it was actually really light touch on, on archives. A lot of this was done by Google, which um, perhaps makes it a much less impressive enterprise. I'm sorry about that. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to unmute Jackie Booth. Uh, she had a, a, a pertinent question. Um, if you are there, is anybody there? No. Okay. There's a question come up on chat, which perhaps I can answer whilst we're yeah. figuring out what's going yeah. on question in person. Um, let me just see who's asked it. Um, so I think this is Jackie. Um, let me see if I can open that up. Uh, yeah, Jackie Booth. So thank you so much, Jackie, for your question. Um, so Jackie's asked in the chat how many of these women were able to combine walking with raising a family. Um, so just I'm just running through them. As far as I know, um, Cheryl Strayed has children and still is active as a walker. Um, Virginia Woolf didn't, Harriet Martineau didn't. Um, Sarah Stoddart has that had a son, um, so she was walking and um, parenting her son and she did a lot of the parenting of her son because her husband was a useless waste of space and was off doing whatever it was he was doing with his mistresses at various times. Um, so that relationship is really interesting, but I think perhaps the, the one that's most interesting is Dorothy Wordsworth, who didn't have children of her own, but after her brother started to have children with his wife Mary, Dorothy became really quite integral to the management of the household and was really involved in the childcare. So as more and more children arrived, Dorothy's responsibilities grew and she was really involved in looking after her niece Dora as well as the boys. And there are accounts in her journals about how she took um, the children up to the Kirkstone Pass, um, walking with them. So that family life is is really much is is really part of that. Though there are times when she also says, "I couldn't walk with William because I had to do X, Y, and Z for the house." So there is a trade-off. She does have restrictions because of these domestic responsibilities that she's taken on but she does still manage to go walking and she does still have that as part of her life whilst also being a, a very significant caregiver to a number of children um, but it is perhaps worth thinking about that that difference because I'm, I'm thinking in particular about Samuel Taylor Coleridge who's another cad who abandons his wife and is a horrible person um, and he just disappears off into the hills and goes walking whenever he wants, leaves the children with his wife, eventually leaves his children and his wife completely and goes off to Malta and never comes back, leaving his brother-in-law to sort it all out. Um, so there, there, there are differences, especially in, in sort of the 18th and into the 19th centuries, um, between what men were able to do and what women were able to do. But that isn't to say that women were completely excluded from walking, even when they had caring responsibilities. It was always possible. It was just more complicated for women. Um, so, um, but I think um, Jackie's question, she goes on to say that she, she finds it hard to escape the responsibility. Am I just being a wuss? I, I don't think that's being a wuss at all. I think for me personally, this is one of the, the things that I've been finding most challenging. I've got a two year old and I'm expecting my second child and being a mother really does impact on my ability to walk. Um, I've managed to climb one mountain in the last two years and there were years before when I was doing 40 a year. So I've, I've been quite frustrated that I haven't been able to get out there more. Um, but we've done lots of local walking um, and that's been really lovely. And, and my son is now getting better at walking. So we were able to do more ambitious things. So I, 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 for me, it's, it's about trying to find a balance and perhaps being more Dorothy Wordsworth in my walking and doing lots and lots of local walks, lots of repeated walks as a way of trying to combine family responsibilities and my love of being in the hills. Um, but if Jackie, if you're a wuss, I'm a wuss as well, because I'm, I also find that balance really tricky to, to, to maintain as well. And some of the other women in, in the history of walking have done too. So thank you so much for a really great question there. And I can see someone in the chat has uh, put a link up to a Facebook group to uh, support such, support people. Um, I'm going to open uh, Grace Shields. I hope you're okay if I open your microphone. I think your question links in with Claire Way Wayman's question, who's, who asks, what first got you interested in walking? Well, Grace's question 
is just pull us on from that, really. So, hey, Grace, are you there? Hi, um, I'm Grace. Um, I'm a graduate student in New York City, and I'm currently in a class called Walking as a Research Practice, um, which is how I heard about your lecture. And so I was wondering if maybe you could tell us a bit about your own personal walking practice. I think you hit on it a bit in the last question, but I just wondered well, what does your personal practice look like and how does your walking connect to your writing? Um, I'm not sure I have a, a practice. Um, I'm far too incompetent a walker to claim anything so grand. Um, I think for me, what I've tried to do, what writing the book has done for me, is to be much more mindful about myself as a walker. I just, I hadn't even thought of there being other women, uh, a history of women walking. I hadn't given that a moment's consideration until I started writing this book. And I have found that that's changed how I walk um, and the sorts of things that I notice and the sorts of things that I talk about and the sorts of companions that I choose as well. Um, so that's, I don't think that even gets close to being a practice, but it's certainly thinking about women's walking has shaped how I understand myself in the landscape when I'm walking. And I found that both empowering and also slightly frustrating because I've not been very good at imagining myself um, in the way that some of the other writers, and Linda Cracknell is particularly good at doing this, is imagining her own walking and connecting that with other women and finding enormous meaning and power in that. I, I've, I've walked in the Berks of Aberfeldy and tried to imagine Dorothy there. I, I've walked all over the Lake District and tried to imagine Harriet Martineau there. And I've just not been very good at it. Um, so I, I think I lack something of that imaginative quality that would enable that fuller connection. But I've still found it enormously powerful to know that whatever it is I'm doing, and to say a lot of the time it's totally incompetent. I have nearly killed myself on mountains. I get my crampons on backwards. I'm more likely to stab myself in the eye with my eye sacks than I am to get it into the actual rock. Um, but I still have found all of those stories have somehow buried themselves into my understanding of, of place and space in a way that it still brings me enormous joy and I hope will continue to bring me joy as well. Brilliant. Thank you for your question. I'm going to now open Tasmin Granger's microphone, if you would care to do that, to speak to us, Tasmin. Um, sorry if anyone feels like I'm just saying, come speak to us. Um, you're obviously pleased, Dan, if you don't feel up to it. Tasmin, how are you? Can you hear me? You can. Oh, hi, I'm Tamsin. Um, I'm a pilgrimage walker writing a book about women walking pilgrimage, and I wondered if you'd come across any in your research. Um... Sort of. Um, I'm thinking of one I um, came across was an, was an American woman called Peace Pilgrim. Have you come across her? Yes, I have. Yeah, so she's the, perhaps the only, only one I've come across. Um, it's not necessarily something I've, I've, I've found, which absolutely does not mean that there aren't women who've written about this. Um, there are so many stories left to be told, and I think that this would be a really interesting um, thing to explore. But I know there's a lot of women, and, and I've, I've spoken to quite a few women who are doing pilgrimage walks. So I wonder if this will be something that emerges, that women's experiences on pilgrimage will be something that we see more in the sort of published writing about walking. But I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed to say that I haven't found anything in particular beyond Peace Pilgrim's experiences, um, which sound absolutely amazing. Um, but I would love to learn more about uh, women who have done these things. I think, I'm sorry, that's a really unsatisfactory answer to your really, really good question. No, not at all. It's really interesting. Um, I haven't come across um, old stories either. Um, so no, no, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm reassured I haven't missed this huge chunk of history. Um, that, that, that's <laughs> That's really reassuring, thank you. It remains hidden. Um, Megan, I've opened your microphone. Hello. 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 Um, hi, Kerry. Hi. Um, I, I, I was um, relatively new to uh, Sarah Stoddard Hazlitt as well, and I've pretty much only read what you, what you wrote in the book, but all the way through it, I mean, I found it quite an emotional story. Um, probably hers was the most emotional one in the book in some ways and I just wondered if you felt like some of that walking that she was doing at that time 
was a bit of a form of kind of like self-flagellation as well for being part of the ruse of the of the divorce like she was trying to take it as much as she was trying to walk off that that effect of the, the bodily effects that it was having it also felt like it was a punishment to her as well yeah I think you're absolutely right there's certainly that that quality to it those punishing distances day after day you know spraining ankles and walking on them regardless um, doing walks with no refreshments or no water and no food ending up absolutely famished at the end of it um, that's a really punishing way of walking and I, I don't think you needed to do that certainly Dorothy Wordsworth was walking at similar times and never did anything like that to herself nor Ellen Wheaton who's a contemporary um, you know perfectly comfortable physically on the walks so I think I think that's a really interesting observation to make about the way Sarah Stoddart Hazlitt talks about walking and that's then made me think again about that that moment where she cleanses her body where she washes off the dirt of the road as some sort of quasi-religious purification um, you know symbolically shedding the, the, the sin of being a collaborator, of being of colluding with her husband on that. And, and that perhaps adds more of an edge to that moment than I perhaps saw when I was writing about it. So that's a really, really lovely way of thinking about it. Uh, it makes me feel really sad for her. I mean, even yeah. sadder than you did. Um, I don't know if that's what happened for you when you were reading it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was quite, it was quite emotional, and it just made me think that she was really punishing herself, and it, and it it made me think about walking in an emotional way, and maybe how some of the other women had walked, and whether that was a difference in the genders of walking as well, and why we walk, and that we're companionate, and and especially because of the story that you told earlier about kind of befriending the family as well, when you you you, you kind of felt quite anxious and quite vulnerable, and maybe that's a difference between the genders, a form of emotional walking. Yeah, and, or, or perhaps a way in which um, the different genders express things. Um, I'm, I'm certain that men feel equally anxious and equally uncertain and, and have a, a perfectly rounded range of emotions. But I yeah. think there's a certain set of ways in which male walking about, writing about walking, has certain tropes that it taps into. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the big landscape, the, the danger, the coming. as well. Coming. Yeah, there's there's not much room in that for expressing oh god oh god I'm terrified. Yeah. Um, and I, but I think that's more accepted of women, though that's also been weaponized against women for, yeah. for writers who've then said, well, women were just far too afraid to have walked. They would just never have walked. They were so frightened. So I think, whilst I think you're that's a, that's a helpful observation, I do think it's important that we don't let ourselves think of male walking and and female walking entirely in those terms because i think that's been to the detriment of how we've understood the history okay, of walking yeah. absolutely yeah but yes i think i think you're right there's a particular emotional resonance about what sarah stardart has that's doing with her walking and, and, and the really powerful way in which that comes across as, as emotionally punishing as well as emotionally cleansing and satisfying so uh, thank you so it's a really lovely observation which i'm going to take away and mull on for a little bit longer thank you thank you thank you um so I'm going to open the microphone for Claire. Uh, it's Claire with an eye. Um, I've seen some, there's some great conversation going on in the chat. I see someone asking um, for a link for Grace Shields' um, research on uh, walking as a research practice. Grace, if you are still with us, if you could share a link in the chat, we'd be really grateful. Um, Claire, are, are you with us for your question? Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm with you. Can you hear me all right? Absolutely fine. Right. Okay. So I, I, mean, I, so I linked up with this talk actually from a literary point of view, but also um, in um, in other news, I'm a marathon runner and ultra runner, which of course involves usually a great deal of walking. So I was fascinated by your reference to Sarah Stoddart Hazlitt as possibly having um, undertaken competitive pedestrianism. And I just wondered if you um, if you were able to say anything more about uh, about that in general. I noticed someone else in, has has found a link it, which they've put in the chat about female pedestrians. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm afraid to say I can't say a huge amount more, but I can tell you that um, a friend of mine is writing a book about um, women's mountaineering, but also women as as competitors in pedestrian sports. Um, so that's in progress, but um, her name is Rachel Hewitt. 
and the book's going to be called In Her Nature. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that that's something that Rachel's very interested in and that should make quite a, a, a substantial part of the book. Um, so I, I must confess almost total ignorance. Um, I was quite ruthless about what I focused on and what I didn't. Mm -hmm wasn't evidence for, for whatever it was it, it got binned um you know in hopes perhaps of other books but at the time it just got binned um to be returned to at a future date but i'm really happy to say that these are the sorts of things that rachel's going to be writing about in her book so that shouldn't be too long I and mean, it's, it's a work in progress but it should be out in the next couple of years and she's on twitter as well so if you want to follow what the progress of the book mm. perhaps you know, ask her she's um it's um dr rachel hewitt on Twitter um, and, and she's um, one of my collaborators with Women in the Hills as well. We're working together with uh, Joe Taylor at Manchester on that project. So all of these sorts of things will be part of, of that project too. So apologies for not knowing more, but I can put you in touch with the woman who does. Excellent, thank you. I'm really enjoying that this is one of those collaborative Q and A's we've just seen, thank you. Um, while I catch up with um, the Q and A, I'm just gonna read out a couple of questions. Um, we don't seem to have Zoe Chan who asked a question very near to my heart, living in Gary Lewisham. Um, she says, I'm not familiar with some of the names that were on your PowerPoint. Um, were any of them urban walkers apart from Virginia Woolf, or do you know of any? Yeah, Anais Nin um, walked exclusively uh, in the cities. Um, and she was, um, a re she's a really interesting figure. So she um, grows up, um, she's got a really complicated European background. She's born in Paris, goes to New York where she grows up, comes back to Spain, lives in Paris for a long time, then flees with the Nazis and goes back to America. So she walks around Paris and New York in particular, uh, and she's walking around New York when she's a teenager and just starting to walk and observe and find that both personally satisfying and intellectually helpful. Um, and it's really interesting to see her writing about those experiences as a young girl. Um, but as she gets older and she becomes more sexually confident and more sexually aware, she starts finding city walking very different. So I have no idea how Nin managed this, but she was having at one point a consecutive affairs with five different men, all of whom thought she was exclusive to them. And she managed to conduct these affairs by walking around Paris. And there were particular places that she would go with each lover or one and, and her husband. Um, and she would use those walks to remember assignations or encounters with different men. And she would sometimes walk around the city on purpose to experience the male gaze and found in that enormous um, psychological, intellectual, physical pleasure. Um, and for me, I, I never thought of walking around a city and feeling like that. I mean, I'm not particularly afraid of walking around a city, but I would never have thought about that walking around a city. Um, and, and so this slightly detached, but also very powerful female gaze that she brings to bear on the city is a really interesting and, and totally different view of urban walking that, that I'd come across. Um, so she's doing something quite different to Virginia Woolf um, with her, her city strolling. Um, but yeah, she's, to she's totally urban. She doesn't do any walking that I know about anywhere else except on the city streets. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I've opened the microphone for Joy, who also has a question. Hello. Uh, yes, just checking you can hear me. We can. Brilliant. Uh, so my question is... Um, until a couple of years ago when I got really interested in Dorothy Wordsworth and uh, read her collection of letters, my sort of idea of um, women from before the, the mid 18th, uh, 1800s was that they just kind of lay around dying in childbirth or getting consumption. Uh, and that they certainly didn't go trekking across the Yorkshire Dales in December, uh, which I mean, I stand by the fact that that's a bad idea to do, <laughs> um, especially before the invention of Gore-Tex. Uh, and then I was really amazed reading um, her letters, how many of them, especially uh, early on, were talking about the walks that she was taking and writing to friends and even uh, where she was saying, oh, I'm going to go to this village. It's only seven miles and walking there alone and uh, coming back. And I just wondered if you could uh, speak at all to where that uh, falsehood came from and sort of 
when it came into uh, the public consciousness uh, that, um, you know, it is this odd thing for women like Dorothy or uh, even more recently for Nan Shepherd to go walking and to spend time outside. And if you have any ideas about why that would be seen as unusual. All I can give is, a, is my best guess. So this isn't necessarily um, the, the, the right answer, but it's my guess based on what I've read. So I hope that will be sufficient. Um, but I, I think it, it might be connected to what happens in the mid 19th century with romantic literature. So the people who were writing at the end of the 18th century didn't think of themselves as part of any particular movement. There were, there were groups of people that were working together, but they didn't think of themselves as a cohesive whole of having shared intellectual objectives. Um, and in the mid 19th century, that's when people look back on that period. Oh, you were all doing the same sort of thing. Oh, we'll call you the romantics. Okay, great. Yeah, you were, you were, you were doing exactly the same sorts of stuff. You're, you're, you're a group. This is a particular period, yet we'll give that a label. And what happens at the same time that they do that is that they rewrite the literary history and write the women out of it almost completely. So in the 18th century, you've got women are best selling as novelists, they're extraordinarily popular as poets, um, male writers masquerade as female writers because that sells better. There's a real buzz around women's writing. And in the middle of the 18th century, when people do this retrospective, they just get rid of all of that. So this whole narrative gets inherited about this period to do with Wordsworth is the is the, the god of this period and Wordsworth walked and that was really important. Therefore walking is really important. Therefore walking is male. So I think these sorts of ideas get connected. There's this horrible revision going on. It's called the great forgetting. Um, that's, that's what it's called in, in, a, in romantic circles, the great forgetting. And I think alongside forgetting that women were, were writers, I think there was a, a a selective and deliberate forgetting that women were active in all sorts of other ways, including as walkers, including as physically visible entities. And that then gets overwritten by um, more Victorian modes of thinking about women. So I think there's this whole revisionism that happens in the mid 19th century. And in the same way that we've inherited ideas about the Romantic period from that moment, I think a lot of our ideas about what walking meant have been inherited from there too. And it's really difficult to challenge that because we've forgotten that that happened at all. Um, and the first part of my career as an academic was spent trying to stop all of that and say, no, look at these amazing women writers who are really, really important. Um, but I think it also had consequences more broadly for our understanding of what women's lives could be in the period. As you say, when you were sort of saying, I just thought they died in childbirth and consumption, I thought that's a perfectly fair way of, of, of thinking about it because those are the stories that we've inherited. Um, but I think what's most frustrating is that there's uh, been a lack of willing to find out, is that in fact true? And all these male writers who just go, well, it couldn't possibly be any different. They just wouldn't have done it any differently. Um, that's what really gets, gets my goat, is that they just don't go back and check and just make sure that that's the case. Um, and as soon as you do, there's this whole world of amazing stories to, to, to find and to, to enjoy. So that's my best guess. There may well be people with better answers than that, but that is my best guess of why that came to be. Brilliant, thank you. And thank goodness we've got people like you going back and doing the double checking. <laughs> this is what I'm good at. I'm, I'm never going to write a wonderful book about Wordsworth, but I can do the, the legwork of finding the stuff and then hopefully other people will do really interesting things with that in the future. So thanks for a really lovely question. Thank you. Um, we are heading towards nine o'clock, which we said we would end at. And um, we've all got homes to go to that we're already in, but you know what I mean. Um, next question goes to uh, Candice. Are, are you there, Candice? Uh, yeah, I am. Is, can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, so thanks for this really fascinating talk. Um, while you were talking about the women who you didn't include in the book, I was kind of struck by, um, with the exception of Austin's letters, they were all works that were either published or intended for publication. Um, so I was curious, I mean, obviously some of the, the women who you do talk about did publish their writing quite recently, but I was wondering if um, you picked up on any, 
way in which their writing was shaped by the sort of form that it took or the audience it was intended to have. Um, and if there are maybe um, period specific differences or anything like that. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. And I think one of the, the patterns, especially with the earlier women, is that they weren't writing for publication. But it's important to bear in mind that there, it wasn't a, a dichotomy between private on one hand and published on the other, that there were other ways in which people, both male and female, circulated works with it within certain groups um either through manuscript or through uh, very limited distribution and that was very common as well so dorothy wordsworth never publishes her journals that doesn't mean that they were meant to be private she shared them with her friends they circulated amongst her her circle of family and acquaintances um and that shaped quite considerably how they were written. And I think particularly that's the case with Elizabeth Carter, who again, never intended her letters to be published. They were published posthumously by her nephew, but she did absolutely intend for her letters to be shared and enjoyed. And, and one of the things that happens in the 18th century is that letters, um, if, unless you marked it private, it would be expected that they would be read out at the communal fireside, that they would be part of the sociability of the family. Um, so there was a way in which they were publicly performative. And you can see that in the way Elizabeth Carter makes her letters super entertaining. You know, the way she writes is so funny and she sets herself up um, as this figure of derision. She's really good at self-mockery. Um, and I think that is also partly the expectation that these letters would be shared with the family of her friend, um, Catherine Talbot, who's the person that she's writing to most often. Um, and she also sends up friends that they are acquainted with as well, as part of that sense of connectivity and sociability. So I think you're absolutely right about the way in which the form of the, of the text shapes it, or, and is shaped by its audience. Um, but it's just, it's just we've inherited an idea that unless it's published, it's not important, it's not valuable, or it's meant to be private. And there's a much more complicated relationship, as I say, especially for these earlier women between what is public and private. And, and I think that does some really interesting things to what they do choose to write and how they choose to write about their walking. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> if I haven't, please do five minutes. Because obviously it's a big question. <laughs> um, I think we've got uh, Cathy McMillan next, um, who's got a question. We're thundering towards the peak of nine o'clock, so. Uh, Hi. Katie, sorry. Um, I've mispronounced so many people's names. <laughs> really, really sorry to all of you, especially to you, Katie. Don't worry. Um, yeah, my question, Kerry, is to do with kind of more contemporary matters. So I personally started a, a bit of a pilgrimage of my own in the last four years in memory of a friend, and I'm following a writer across Europe, and I wish I'd had your book to look at because I was, again, mainly reading male writers. But what I found really interesting talking to women of different ages was that I'm 38 now. I was probably about 34 when I set out and I had always felt like walking, adventure, exploration, all of these things were not for me. It was very male dominated. And like, if you asked me to explain what I imagined with adventure, it would be a man with a beard climbing a mountain. But what was really interesting to me is that actually a lot of the younger women I talked to, sort of women in their 20s, don't have that same issue with like um, social conditioning. And I, I wondered if you could see a change that's happening. Um, maybe books like yours are kind of part of that. But it, I'm just curious to know whether you think that is something that is changing now. I'm sorry, you broke up just at the crucial moment. Could you just re say the question again? I'm sorry, I just missed the crucial section. Which, where did you, when did I get cut off? Um, I didn't quite get what tradition you were wanting me to talk so, about. So, so just just how um, the tradition of exploration, adventure, whether that's walking or any kind of kind of exploration, young women don't seem to be as affected by that kind of negative uh, association that I had. And I wondered if you could see a, a change, a social change happening now. I think I think you're right. I think there is a change, um, and one of the I've done an interview for the Tough Girl podcast and therefore I've been watching 
the Tough Girl podcast come, uh, and the, the interviewees that they, they did before me. And it's absolutely terrifying. You know, here's me just what right, I, I just wrote a book. And these women are doing extraordinary things. They're walking across mountain ranges, they're walking across continents. They're doing amazing things. And, and the Tough Girl podcast is doing a lovely job of highlighting those experiences and promoting them. If you'd have asked me this question when I started the book, I, I would have probably said, I don't really think so. I think we've still got this problem. Mm -hmm. And I think over the last three or four years, maybe, maybe not quite as far away as that, I, I certainly felt a change in energy. And one of the things that starting up the Women in the Hills Network did was reveal just how much appetite there is, not just amongst women, but just people more generally, mm -hmm. to now have different stories told. Um, so I, th I think we are still dealing with the legacy of the bearded male adventure. And I think it's going to take a lot more books yeah. to totally combat that. I mean, I, I really do sincerely hope that this is just the first shot in a revisioning of that whole tradition. Um, and we're going to need a lot more weight to do that. But I also know that there's, you know, Rachel's writing a book. I know Joe Taylor's doing work on Dorothy Wordsworth. I know all sorts of women that are doing research on women's clothing and getting out there and there's lots and lots of stuff about women cycling so there's this whole network of people who are working on books in progress so i think in the next couple of years it's going to be very difficult to make that claim that mm -hmm. you know adventuring isn't for women and i hope that that then translates into women like you and women like me as well feeling like adventuring is more something that's that's available for us that people who adventure look like us mm. I think I think we're in the middle of that moment happening um, yeah and I think it's enormously exciting so yeah I, th I, th I think change is coming good good positive ending hopefully <laughs> yeah I think it's always good to end things on a really good question I um, there's been some great questions and some great talk in the chat this evening, so I'm really grateful for this. Um, before, um, I was going to ask Annie Bowers uh, to ask the last question because hers was really good, but she's gone, so I'm going to have to read it out. So um, I'm sorry that I won't say it as well as she will. Um, there's a lot of people keen to find out more on this, uh, Kerry. Is there like um, a hashtag or a group or something that people could follow? to get more information. Not everyone's on Twitter, but you know, Twitter is available to everyone. Um, there are, <laughs> how to answer that question? No, but there should be. And there is perhaps sort of something like that. Um, Women in the Hills that I've, I've mentioned before, bef we've been hit really hard by, by lockdown and, and the pandemic. Um, both myself and Rachel have significant childcare responsibilities. So the network had started off with huge energy and has had to go quiet because we just simply haven't been able to do the work on it. But we are hoping to get that going again. And we are absolutely going to be focusing on bringing the history of women's involvement in the outdoors more generally, not just walking to broader attention so if that would be a good place to start and from there you can see some of the people that we follow and who follow us who are really involved in various aspects of this so that might be a nice gateway into getting into some of the networks and some of the discussions about this topic um, but it really should have its own hashtag there really should be something bringing all of this together um, because I think one of the things I found when I was writing the book is that there's lots of disparate bits of knowledge lots of bits of information but we haven't necessarily done a good job of drawing that together and therefore seeing the weight of it the significance of it and I think something something that would bring that all together would be really powerful and, and, and is certainly needed um, but all I can offer at the moment is a not quite satisfactory substitute um, but Women in the Hills on Twitter might be a good place to start. Yeah we're more than happy in being part of that as well because obviously um, a lot of our audience are women um, on the final question, Annie Bowers, I'm sorry, I don't think you're here anymore, so I'm going to ask it for you. Um, she says, I really hate the patriarchal overtones of so much walking. We we're expected to conquer or dominate the land. So I love what's being said about the emotional links women have with their landscape and how it allows them independence and empowerment, uh, I think, which is brilliant. Have you, recre have you recreated many of your walks you have written about? And if so, what did you take away from doing them? Oh, that's a terrific question. Um, Why so did the last? <laughs> thanks, Scott. Um, I have to say, I'm nowhere near as noble and um, sensible as Nan Shepherd. I really do love a mountain top. I, I adore being on the top of things and the views. 
Um, but I don't ever feel like I've conquered it. I think what I feel like I've done is conquered myself. Um, that I, I, the, the one mountain I have managed to walk in the last two years was in July and um, I got a weather window and had childcare and my husband and I were in the Highlands so we went off and walked um, a Glaven in Kintail and I'd forgotten how small I am you know these, these massive mountains I hadn't been in them for ages and I had forgotten just how small I am amongst them and I got this enormous thrill at the thought that my my puny legs you know my unfit puny legs if I just turn them over enough times would eventually get me to the top of the mountain that I wanted to climb. Now that notion got bashed to pieces by the horrible steepness of the final part. And I, I ended up collapsed in a heap with my husband trying to shove a twirl into my mouth to try and revive me. Um, but between but at the bottom and at the top, that was a really thrilling idea that I had just managed to turn my legs over enough. There was no sense of defeating the mountain. It was still there after I left. It's still going to be there in hopefully thousands of years time. Um, but I do think that certainly the way that Nan Shepherd talks about mountains and also Dorothy Wordsworth too, and, and Harriet Martineau. Um, Harriet Martineau is not interested in conquering the Lake District. She's interested in learning the Lake District. And she's doing that for her own self-knowledge and for her own physical development. And Dorothy Wordsworth is just interested in places that have meaning or which she can have give meaning to so that she can keep those relationships alive. Um, so I, I think that's a, a really powerful thing um, that has shaped some of my walking. Um, though, as I say, I, I, I really, really, really enjoy going up high and I, I, I can't do anything about that. You know, Nan Shepherd talks about, you know, eschewing the tang of heights. I, I can't, I just can't. I, I love going up mountains. Um, but as I've uh, in, as, my, as my second pregnancy is progressing, my, my, I'm having a lot of pelvic pain. So going up big stuff isn't possible. And it's been a wonderful thing to be able to fall back on an alternative view of walking. I don't have to go up to the tops. Even if I want to, I don't have to. There is meaning to be found elsewhere. And being able to call upon those writers who've done those sorts of things has been enormously beneficial to me as a walker. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, a brilliant talk. Thank you for all of your contributions. It's been a, a really good evening. Thank you very much. Um, really quick plug at the end. Um, this event will be on Conway Hall's YouTube channel sometime soon once we've edited it and got it together. Um, we run a regular sport nightly series called Thinking on Sunday. It talks of ethics and society. Check that out. Our next reweirding is on the 1st of October, which is a middle-aged man talking about his uh, walks. Uh, Gareth E. Rees speaking on his book, Unofficial Britain. Um, also on the 6th of October, we're doing a talk on uh, mer people um, with the London 14 Society. A lot going on. Do please check out Conway Hall. Thank you very much. Thank you to Kerry. Thank you to the Invisible Helpers. Thank you all for your contribution. Good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>